Hey guys, it's Emre from the Elite Guitar Academy. We'll be covering a whole range of topics in this series, from technical basics all the way up to the opera advanced end of the spectrum, both as an addendum to our online curriculum and also as supplemental tutorials for the sheet music portfolio. So that's a wide range of subjects, but the common theme is going to be the same across the curriculum and the channel, which is regardless of your musical background, and current level or the age you started your training uh, your goals are achievable with the right approach and practice so I thought a good starting point would be the practice routine itself because whether it's a simple drill you're working on or an advanced piece your progress is going to depend on the productivity of your practice sessions so that's where we'll start kind of leveling the playing field and eventually get to more advanced topics, including all that brazen stuff on the channel, as some of you put it. I do want the pieces in our portfolio uh, and the channel to be a source of inspiration, but I also want to make sure you have access to all the tools and methods to get you there as well. You know, everyone's musical goals are different, but in order to take your playing to the next level and to eventually expand outside the sort of standard traditional guitar repertoire you want to ensure you're building on a solid foundation and gradually develop a capable and flexible skill set so we'll break things down into simple manageable steps and hopefully inspire you to practice so you can enjoy your own progress and see that your goals aren't out of reach not an impossibility as they may seem at first so what exactly makes a practice session productive for me, there are a few key methods I use depending on the context, like visualization, mental practicing. I want to touch on these as well, so they can be a part of your tool set. But there's, there's one method that I always apply to every single piece I play and record. It's slow practicing. It's an age-old method used by students and instructors, usually with mixed results. Uh, but let's see how we can add a little twist and turn it into kind of a power tool. It really is generic advice, right? Just practice slowly and you'll figure it out, somehow. You hear it constantly from everyone. The trouble is you could be practicing something slowly and incorrectly, building some stubborn habits. So it's not about just repeating something over and over again at a slow tempo and expecting things to magically start sounding great. The way I'd like to approach slow practicing is as a deep scan of a given passage, like a troubleshooting scan. Think of it as an opportunity to increase awareness of different aspects of your playing. It could be, uh, you know, basic aspects like left and right hand techniques, um, or more complex issues like, like fingering efficiency, very commonly overlooked. So let's break it down and look at some actionable steps. Uh, so we got to consider how slow, what exactly, and how or which aspects right say you just picked up some piece looked it over a few times uh, maybe watched a video performance and sort of became familiar with it you know and you're ready to dive deeper and really start internalizing the piece at this point you probably have a good idea on your final performance tempo this may change slightly, but a good starting tempo for these slow scans is about half your target tempo, or even slower. So, as a beginning level example, if you're practicing your chromatic drills, uh, and your target tempo is somewhere around... Uh, then you want to set your initial practice tempo somewhere here. So just one note in place of two, right? Uh, same idea for advanced cases. If your target performance tempo is, let's say, uh, then you wanna set, take maybe half that tempo. Right? You could use a metronome to be precise. But it's not an exact science, you know, uh, to pick an approximate starting point. Because if you feel you're not able to pay full attention to all the details, you can always slow it down some more. 
And to all beginners, uh, there are going to be some advanced examples along the way, but nothing you won't be able to follow along. And I think it's important to to keep an eye on some upcoming issues, especially if the concept applies across different levels. The next step is going to be dividing your piece into short segments. So these are what we'll be running through and doing the troubleshooting. How are we splitting it up? If it's a basic drill, just take the smallest chunks you want to focus on. If it's a piece, you can set these divisions as the actual phrases, but again, no need to be super accurate at this point because we'll be switching up these segments anyway, as we'll see in a little bit. So the core routine is simply playing through each of these segments one at a time at the slow tempo, but concentrating on just one thing. Isolating one aspect of your technique, maybe one feature of the piece. So which one to start with? This is going to be largely to, uh, up to you depending upon your objectives, but typically the left hand is going to be priority. My favorite starting point is always uh, focusing on the efficiency uh, of each movement and fingering sequence. Just a quick side note here because efficiency is going to be another common theme. Figuring out what's really efficient for yourself is definitely going to get easier in time as you uh, gain more experience, being mindful of each fingering, whatever you're playing, and experimenting with every position you come across and developing that sense of efficiency over time. But to help uh, speed this process up using some real examples and repertoire, we recently launched a new project, the slow walkthrough videos for the entire portfolio. So <laughs> it ended up being an enormous project, uh, but it's almost finished thanks to our members and patrons contributions. So maybe in a separate video, I'll go over how these videos can be useful as additional tools for your practice. And frankly, it's a bit of a cheat sheet for, for those looking for some shortcuts when practicing these pieces. For now, let's continue with the routine. So remember, we're isolating each component. And when you're scanning for a specific left hand aspect, everything else will be relevant, including the right hand, by the way. How's that gonna work? Well, you can sort of follow along with light strokes to just to keep track or not at all, which is usually what I do. Just go through the left hand movements and really focus on each aspect for that segment. So what specific aspects of the left hand are we scanning for though? Anything you're working on at your current level is fair game. A new technique, some aspect, a component of it, or a general idea like keeping the tension low on the left hand. For beginners, there are a few absolutely essential left-hand basics you want to establish, like finger placement, independence, coordination, thumb placement, right? So each of these aspects could be a separate scan uh, to make sure you're consistently applying them on the pieces and drills you're practicing. More on this uh, application issue in just a little bit. As you move into more advanced levels, uh, there are going to be fewer of these basics uh, to pay attention to and more more of the fingering work because in the beginning stages fingering is more straightforward right one fret per finger being the kind of default system but in time gradually with uh, additional voices polyphony counterpoint Bach before you know it uh, things start stacking up and the fingerboard kind of turns into a chessboard <laughs> for a new piece initially there are going to be lots of undecided fingerings and position changes the key is using these slow scans to identify and eliminate uh, all these problematic spots. So out of all these potential solutions, you can choose the best one before one of the poor candidates uh, starts becoming internalized over too much repetition. To uh, demonstrate the concept further, uh, I'll give you a detailed close-up example of fingering efficiency. So we'll just continue back in the studio for that. Hi, I wanted to give you a more detailed example on fingering efficiency. Uh, it's going to be a slight tangent to practice routines, but fingering work is such an essential part of what we do, and it affects so many different aspects of a performance. I wanted to make sure I spent some time on this and just chat with you about the, the kind of uh, behind the scenes thought process, and also explain what I meant by chessboard earlier too. So we'll just take a short section from the harpsichord concerto again. 
you won't necessarily need the sheet music to follow along because it's only going to be like four notes. It's more the general approach I wanted to emphasize. So this is a short figure right after the opening and it goes like We can even take out the open bass to simplify. So we have. So here, if you start with a default one finger per fret kind of approach, we have one, three, two, right? Then we need these two notes, C and A, here on the same fret. So what would you choose for that? 2-3 three or 3-4? Three, well, for the previous note here, we have 2 on the second string, right? So we don't want to rush it two strings over right away, which wouldn't be a very smooth transition. But 3 and 4 are available while you're playing that. So that's a much better option. No disconnection there. Which brings up then why not start with 4 instead of 3. So you can kind of prepare in advance, eliminate some extra movement. Plus we're using the same finger 4 for that same note, the A, which makes it even more efficient. Here's another one. If you're looking to achieve a more of a spaced out kind of fingering or or if you feel your fingers are a bit too cramped up here how about starting with one to two then one again on second string which leaves you with two and three for that chord so that's another perfectly feasible option now if you take transitions into account it gets even more interesting uh, just to go over some possible scenarios if the next few notes or whatever is coming up is further down the fingerboard and uh, you want to spare some fingers for smooth transition, we can start on three again on the second string, then two, but now slide two so you can end up on one and two. Right? So now we have three and four available to reach down for any uh, potential situation. Though in this case, for this piece, uh, the next position is actually back here. So I'm just gonna stick with the previous solution, which was uh, one, four, two, four. How about coming into this position? If you're coming from a bar, for example, where your first finger is fairly flat and close to the surface, maybe you wanna land in a partial bar position, like so. Or maybe you want an easier target during a fast piece, you know, catching that one single fret using a larger surface area, right? And the rest could be the same. So in just half a measure, in a single beat, so many different variations and opportunities to explore. Another quick side note on uh, sheet music. Because those of you working on our sheet music releases may be wondering, instead of going through all this trouble, why not just follow, follow the fingering on the page, right? So uh, these are some considerations taken into account behind the scenes if you're preparing for a performance or arranging to be able to share the best possible version, your best version of the piece with your audience. But still, it's not set in stone. So I wanted to emphasize it's important to take each fingering with a grain of salt, wherever it comes from, even if it's your own. Sometimes we're a little uh, too attached to our own solutions, you know, especially if it was hard to come up with. But when you think you've finalized the fingering sequence, the more scans you do for other aspects, the more likely you'll find an even better solution. Or an earlier one may turn out to be more feasible. Also, over the years, I've worked with students with disabilities, different physical traits, limitations like joint issues, and that's been a great lesson for me as well, seeing that there is no perfect fingering sequence, a, a one-size-fits-all solution for everyone. 
rather it's an ongoing a personal exploration to discover what works best for your own technique. So it's invaluable to spend some time on fingering and slow practicing gives you great clarity and makes it easier to choose because when you strip it down to basics at a slow tempo, then your reasoning to choose a particular fingering over another becomes crystal clear. Okay, on to the second round. After all the left hand scans, time to move on to the right hand. What to scan for? For beginning levels, uh, finger alternation should be a priority scan. In other words, not repeating right hand fingers in a row unless you really have to. Most players, if they're too you know, focused on the left hand, which is most of us actually, you, know, you won't even notice that the, the culprit is sometimes the repeated strokes here, causing all kinds of issues like messing up your tempo, tensing up all these muscles and just throwing things off. So just slowly scan through the segment with your full attention on the right hand and look for repeated strokes as in no IIs or MMs, right? Rather, you want to keep a continuous IM alternation. In the advanced levels, there are going to be exceptions to this, but these repeated IIs or MMs should feel as awkward as taking two left steps or right steps in a row when you're walking. Now, for advanced levels where you don't have to consciously think about alternating anymore, we can scan for right hand efficiency. And this could be in the form of looking for any places to include the A finger. So, Pima, right? I'll sometimes do that in melodic segments just to spread the load across three fingers instead of just two. For example, in a, a section like instead of I am, we can use AMI alternation here, like so. Much more efficient and comfortable. Another really important uh, right hand scan, especially for a beginner, but for any player who's not too happy with their sound, you can now do a scan for tone color. You know, working towards a full and clear sound uh, is really important. It's like your sound signature, right? Is it just kind of flimsy or a full sound with good projection? We'll go over the right hand basics in detail and cover different aspects of sound production down the line. But as a quick uh, overview and for the purpose of these scans, just make sure you always have good contact with the string, with each stroke, and initiate all the strokes from the top joint here. So they do the majority of the work and not so much these little joints larger the radius better projection smaller radius not so much so we're using these slow scans to identify any weak sounding areas and fixing them by by fully sustaining each note and establishing that solid contact as you run through these segments by the way at this stage it's not so much about dynamics rather getting a consistent full-bodied sound regardless of your dynamic level. You can do this for all the segments till you have a nice and consistent tone all the way through the piece. Here's why this sort of sound scan is really important. Most players are looking for some holy grail, some special combination of polishes, different shapes, wrist modifications even, that'll give them that perfect sound, the perfect tone color, at the risk of undermining their core technique. Now, using targeted drills can definitely be helpful, and we'll, we'll do a lot of those too. But for most players, it's a difficult step to put these, put new concepts into action. So it's all gonna come down to how well you apply things you learn in your actual performance. And these slow scans are a great way to bridge that gap between theory and practice to sort of contextualize new techniques and internalize them. So that's the general idea for these slow practice scans, but they can certainly be applied to any other aspect. Uh, anything that you feel needs a bit more attention in your playing. Is it hammer-ons? Is it maybe position shifts? Or performance-related issues? Uh, more on this um, in just a bit, but whatever you choose in the first few scans, I suggest kind of postponing and deprioritizing things like tempo, uh, rhythmic structure even because you don't want to 
let me put it this way. You want the foundational aspects to be the main focus, like the left and right hand basics, which are the majority of the work anyway, right? Then it's going to be easier to gradually add the secondary stuff down the line. Okay, so when we're finished working on all these issues, on these short segments, then we're just going to string them together and work on longer phrases. Maybe two, three segments back to back, but connected. You want the, the beginnings and ends of the initial short segments also smoothly connected with no rough transitions in between. Then in the final stage, we're going to do a slow scan for the entire piece. Now this at half the tempo or less is going to take at least twice as long. So this is the sort of marathon and, and it's a great opportunity to stress test your overall technique, endurance, memory, to see if you can get through the piece with no pauses or hesitation. One final thing before we end. You may notice during these full run throughs that these are also great practice for presence. You know, all of us to varying degrees in this day and age have increasingly short attention spans, lack of focus, poor concentration. For a musician, this is especially problematic, right? If it comes up during a performance or a recording session. So these slow scans can be kind of a meditative process uh, to help get back to that relaxed and present state of mind and maintain focus throughout your performance. For each arrangement I prepare for recording, I find that this approach, this is going to sound ironic, but I find this sort of slow practice actually accelerating the whole process. <laughs> because taking the time during these scans and going through all these different stages of practice you sort of start appreciating all the subtle details and internalizing the piece with that fresh perspective. And with each scan, things just become more memorable. So at the end of the day, you can eliminate a huge amount of redundant repetition uh, during your practice. And with that grunt work out of the way, you end up making a lot more progress in a much shorter amount of time. So practicing becomes more fun. To sum it all up, uh, it's a great tool, great uh, method for deep scanning your pieces or drills at any level of playing, identifying trouble spots, and for internalizing techniques and concepts. I hope you found this useful. I'll see you in the next video. And happy slow practicing. Kanalımızı Türkiye'den de takip eden uh, arkadaşlar ve öğrenciler için kısa bir not eklemek isterim. Otomatik çeviriler malum her zaman çok net olmayabiliyor. Ee, bazı konuları zaman içinde Türkçe videolarda da işlemek istiyorum. Bunları da ileride kendi kanalımda bulabilirsiniz. Görüşmek üzere. Müzik